even the even the hagiographical literature in in confirmation of what you just said has none of that sense of original sin or the body as problematic somehow. There is a story which I didn't go into in Aflati about uh, Kera Khatun complaining that Rumi's matrimonial attention to her has lessened. And so he pursues her that night and they have intercourse 70 times and she has to run on top of a building to uh, get away from him, which is you know, some sense of proving the virility of the saints, uh, which, you know, in a way also emphasizes the, the self-restraint that's involved in, in their asceticism. It's not that they don't have the desire, it's that they're putting it in check somehow. Yeah. But uh, there is no embarrassment at all about these kinds of stories. So it, you're absolutely right. No, no embarrassment, but there is, um, there's a very long Iranian tradition of demonizing uh, lust. Uh, the, the demon powers in Zoroastrianism, that is the conceptualization of lust as a female demon, uh, she is um, an arch demon and is equated with Ahriman himself um, in the mythology. So there is a, what, at the same time, there's no embarrassment but there is total condemnation of the power of lust over the spiritual nature. So how do you, with, with the English, it's total shame and condemnation. But here, I think it's open. And but when, you look at, uh, when you look at those passages that are translated into Latin, when you actually read them in Persian, there's no prurience in them. Would you agree? They're not prurient stories. They're very didactic. They're, they're humorous. He, ha humorous. he has a line. He has a line where he says, "Has le man has nist tahlimast uh, bait a man bait nist eklimast." My pornography, or my dirty jokes, is not are not dirty. They are didactic, and my verse is not uh, just versification. It's an entire civilization, entire country, entire mm -hmm. climate. Mm -hmm. Good. Roderick. Yeah. It was too long to say, but I was tempted to ask Alan since he didn't really know better than he <coughs> To what extent does that sort of attitude that you describe change with the arrival of Islam? Uh, given ancient Iranian or ancient Indian attitudes towards sexuality, how does that change? How does what you describe in terms of condemnation, how does that change? Or indeed, do you think it does change? That's another lecture. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I don't, I don't either, that's why I uh, it seems to me that there are lots of continuities with the Zoroastrian past. I mean, one of the, one of the privileges I, I have, and I mean privilege, I don't mean I'm boasting, but one of the privileges I have, have of approaching Moulavi from the Pahlavi and the Western background of, of Iran in, is that I sense continuities that, that may not be apparent to people who come to it from another direction. But I don't know the answer to that question. I know that, that many things which seem to me to be purely Zoroastrian, my wife will tell me, no, that's current thought. That's what we think in Iran. It's not Muslim. It's Iranian. It's an Iranian view. So, you know, uh, this is but a I, book. I do think, though, in the Mass Navi, that the, the assumption that there's something very natural and predictable about sexual urges and funny is the dominant one. It's, it's not so much, of course, the lust is condemned at points, but it's also enjoyed as something humorous, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. It, I mean, it, it, it really doesn't, in his tableau of social interaction, it's often just an observation that this is funny. This is what people do. It's like fire and cotton. When you put them together, this is the story of the uh, the woman and the, the slave girl that goes with the bin from the bath back to the husband. It, it's just predictable. This is what's going to happen. You're putting match to cotton. Yeah. Mohammed. 
Uh, I just wanted to ask you, Alan, about uh, something you did. When, when you started it, if I remember properly, uh, the Maulana Rumi is saying, uh, every moment I see an image, I create an image and then I dispose of it. Something else, I make something else and then I throw it away. Yeah. Yeah. In a certain sense, all that happens, the human point of view, basically, is that God manifests himself and that we, with our sort of perception power that we have, we, 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 we take in this, this, this phenomenon, or this, this manifestation, that's all that happens. Um, I think he's dealt with in some other moral and poems, including the one that you mentioned, where um, somebody is saying, if I can't see the way things really are, it's better I don't have these eyes. If I'm not mistaken, it's one of the prophets of that said, that's your aid. Is it not that mm -hmm. for him? Mm -hmm. So that's a shoy one of the prophets. Uh, if Abraham sees something rising, he says, this is God, it falls, that's not the one. Something else comes, that's not the one. It's a, a, a descending towards the higher things. The prophet Muhammad says, uh, I read, uh, seek God's pardon 70 times every hour. So this is the, the commentary say, say, commentary say this is because he has not seen things. He's repenting of how he saw things before, because he is ascending. So there is a point of view in Islamic mysticism, or Islam in general, Islam generally, that the, the human being, our purification is to see God. It's not happening unless every moment there's a higher perception going on, which is achieved by the vesting of the human part of the vision and the increasing of the divine part of the vision, which by which the divine perceives itself by means of the human being. So I'd say this is some philomestical side to all this uh, about the image that is destroyed, or the creation that is destroyed. That's what we're doing all the time at this moment. We're all sharing the 